Um, hello everyone and welcome to another STF COVID webinar. I'm Leon Wiley, I'm Lead Officer at Hepatitis Scotland and I'm Co-Chair of the Sexual Health Bloodborne Virus National Prevention Leads. Today's topic is how are your sites, care of in injection related wounds and people who use drugs. In the best of times, let alone now, people who also inject drugs often face an assortment of barriers to accessing health services. Self-management of injection related wounds has been common and has likely increased a loss across the last few months. When people do seek care, the wounds are often large and infections are pronounced. In this webinar, we'll look at current research, service initiatives and training opportunities that can enhance knowledge around injecting injuries and infections. Topics that include the simple assessment and management of wounds and current scientific findings related to venous access. But we'll also explore current issues faced during COVID and look to the future by exploring how to ensure regular staff inquiry regarding and assessment of someone's injection sites. The webinar sits um, alongside this week's launch of SDF's new wound care e-learning e module, How Are Your Sites? Um, now that's available if you look in the chat section down on the right of the screen. There we have um, and if you look there, you'll see the link to the e-learning section. Um, we've got three speakers today who'll give a 10 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session at the end. Attendees online now can submit questions throughout the webinar and the question and the question tab, which you've just seen the link for, which should be down on the right side of your screen. My co-chair today, Sophie Given, who's the National Training Development Officer in Harm Reduction and Emergency Response, will then join us for the discussion session at the end, where she'll summarise the questions being asked of the speakers. Our speakers today are Dr. Alison Cool, who's a lecturer in nursing at Napier University, and has also helped develop the e-learning course launched on Monday. She'll also be co-chairing a working group with Sophie, developing Scotland's, and I think the world's first, national wound care guidelines for people who inject drugs. Next, we have Dr. Magdalena Harris, and she's an Associate Professor and a Qualitative Researcher the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Then we'll hear from John Campbell, who's the IEP Improvement Manager at NHS GGC, and he's also co-chair of the Scottish IEP Guidelines Development Group. So first up, we've got Alison Cool, who um, has pre-recorded this for us, as unfortunately our scheduling was not the best, and she couldn't make it online today. She won't be available for questions after, but Sophie Given will field any specific wound care once. So thank you and over to Alison. Okay. I'm Alison Cool. I'm a nurse specialist for wound care uh, in the harm reduction team at Spittle Street Centre in NHS Lothian. And I also work as a lecturer at Edinburgh Napier University. I've got a background as a tissue viability nurse specialist. Uh, and started working with people who inject drugs about 20 years ago when I was involved in a health project with the big issue in Glasgow. And I currently lead the wound clinic as part of the harm reduction team. Um, Spittle Street, the wound clinic that runs at Spittle Street is a drop-in. It runs once a week on a Thursday. Um, we see mostly leg ulcer patients at the moment uh, and more complex wounds in current and former injector, injectors, but also we see people with acute and recent injecting injuries, some local skin and soft tissue infections. Um, I'm a prescriber, so I'm able to um, prescribe antibiotics where that's appropriate, although very often um, clients don't really need antibiotics. They maybe just need good wound care and antimicrobial dressings. We see abscesses. And a lot of clients come in looking for advice and reassurance about injecting site. Sometimes we see people with um, DVTs or early DVTs, limb swelling, which we need to refer on to the hospital. Um, since COVID, the service has continued um, slightly differently because we have more distancing. We don't have a busy waiting room anymore. We have clients coming in one at a time, they come in, we encourage them to wash their hands uh, and they come into the wound clinic room once we are dressed in PPE. We always wore gloves and an apron, but we've added to that with eye protection and a mask. Um, we haven't um, seen many changes, things are a bit slower. Uh, 
and we have extended the service because there's less pressure on other services which aren't actually existing or running at the moment. Um, we use the dental room at Spittle Street and the dentist isn't providing a service there at the moment, so we have more capacity to extend our hours. Um, we encourage clients to do a bit more themselves. So, for example, we'll encourage them to wash their own legs if they're using, if they're a leg ulcer patient and washing their legs in a bucket or encourage them to wash their hands in the sink and um, wash their wounds themselves so as to avoid aerosol or splashback. That's not always possible for, for everybody, of course. And some clients are isolating, so they are cared for at home and we've made up self-care wound management packs on an individual basis and have them delivered. So the services continued as before, but with some adjustment. So together with Sophie Giffen at SDF, we've designed a short e-learning package for anyone who works with people who inject drugs. It's called, how are your sight? Because um, people often ask that question, and but rarely inspect the site. They get the answer OK or fine. Um, and that, as I said, might be due to a lack of confidence or knowledge in what they're actually looking at. So this e-learning offers a, a baseline of education and is divided into five sections. We looked first of all at the structure and function of the skin, um, what's normal, um, what it actually does and what injecting through it, uh, what the impact of injecting through it has. And then we looked at what uh, causes wounds and skin problems in injectors. And the third section looks at assessing skin, what's normal, what's abnormal and What's, um, what different types of wounds you can see. And that section also looks at signs of venous disease that can occur as a result of injecting in the leg or the groin. Um, that can cause, as damage occurs, that can cause visible skin changes on the surface of the leg. And people who inject, and in particular people who have injected for a long time, may not know what those changes actually are but they are signs of damage that will ultimately lead to end-stage venous disease, which is an ulcer, which you want to avoid at all costs. So it's expensive to treat and causes a huge amount of human suffering. So we want to try and avoid that by allowing people to be able to see these signs, pick them up on the legs and offer some conversation about reducing harm. The fourth section of the training um, looks at identifying infection, which is important, what's minor, what's major, what needs to be referred on. And the final section looks at simple treatments. And that training programme is due to be launched shortly. So thank you for listening to this introduction about my wound care experiences during COVID. Um, Sophie and I both hope that you enjoy the e-learning that's been written and find it useful. Um, but that was Alison, obviously Alison Cool, explaining um, the background behind the e-learning and what what people could actually get out of that e-learning, which I, th I think is a very good course. So next, um, sorry, sorry, um, next we shall have on um, Magdalena Harris, who's a um, associate professor and um, qualitative researcher at the London School of hygiene and tropical medicine, and she's going to um, talk about some of her work that she's been doing in London, some very, really interesting work, um, has been doing across many years, so she's a very um, well-respected researcher across the country, and so, Magdalena, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I should have some slides coming up. Great. Wonderful. Well, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about wound and bone care, working with people who inject drugs to prevent health harms. Um, can you change the slide, please? Cool. So I'm going to be drawing on data from um, a current study called Care and Prevent. And this has got um, two aims, to improve skin and soft tissue infection, prevention care and treatment interventions for people who inject drugs. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. Uh, the other aim is around AA amygdalosis, which is um, a renal disease. And I've included references uh, in all of the slides, so you can look at any other information you want to find out more, and people can also feel free to get, to get in touch with me. So if you're interested in AA amygdalosis, there's a, there's a reference there. But we were uh, interested in looking at what the barriers and facilitators were to accessing um, or practicing timely care, and also to learn from the experts people who inject drugs who have managed to self-care for their wounds successfully, 
or, um, or, or avoid getting them in the first place. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, cool. So um, this is a mixed method study. We, we had a really comprehensive survey and it was amazing to have 455 people who inject drugs in London fill it out. Um, and uh, what I really want to highlight here is the high proportion of people who are street homeless or had a history of street homelessness. So 78% of the 455 had, um, had, had experience of rough sleeping and nearly half were currently in a hostel or street homeless. And the main in drug injected by the majority was heroin and crack in combination, followed by uh, heroin uh, in isolation. Next slide. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so this is a bit of a messy slide, but again, I want them to be, um, I put a bit of information on them so that you can look at them again uh, for reference. Now, of the 455 participants, 65% uh, had either an abscess or, a, or cellulitis or um, venous disease, venous ulcer. And, and what was really shocking to me was that nearly half of, of these people were hospitalised for what are essentially um, treatable conditions. Now, um, and this is really reflected in the complications. So of the 291 people with abscess or cellulitis, over a quarter, 27% reported sepsis or blood poisoning, or 7% reporting endocarditis. So these are serious complications and they really reflect delays in receiving care. Next slide, please. So we looked at what, well, what are the associations of skin and soft tissue infections? And unsurprisingly, we found that older age was, if you inject more, um, more likely to have a skin and soft tissue infection. Uh, if you reuse equipment, but also uh, if people who practice subcutaneous, so skin popping or intramuscular injection, and people who took four or more attempts to achieve an injection were much more likely to have a skin and soft tissue infection. Now, what these uh, issues highlight in red really indicate is vein damage, right? So most people who inject drugs will, will start going in their arms, and, uh, and when these veins become damaged, then they're much more likely to transition to more dangerous sites, such as the, the femoral, the groin, or the jugular, the neck, or to, um, to skin pot, or to go you know, subcutaneous, um, intramuscular in the arm or in the bum. And, and doing all of these things is really going to enhance the risk of health harms. And you can see this here in Marie's quote, where she says, every time I I tried getting a vein, I couldn't get the vein, I had to take it out and skin pop it, I kept on doing that and I got one abscess after the other. Now I come from New Zealand and in New Zealand people would keep going in their veins for a long time. I'm an ex-user and I managed to inject in my arms for 10 years. Now this is pretty unusual in the UK and I was interested in why, why people are losing their veins so quickly here. And uh, so I did some exploratory work with Dan Cicerone from, from the States, and we tested the acidity of people's heroin samples. And we found that people who were injecting uh, in London using citric acid to prepare their heroin, uh, they were highly acidic solutions. They were injecting, uh, it was about the equivalent of vinegar. Next slide, please. Okay. So, so uh, you know, so really, if we're thinking about prevention and vein care, I think it's fundamental to think about what, you know, addressing the acidity of these solutions, the amount of acidifier people are using and cooking up their gear. Um, lab work from Jenny Scott has shown that, um, you know, your basic sort of heroin deal needs about a quarter of a sachet of Bit-C or Citric to, to cook it up. And these are the pharmacy provided um, uh, sachets. And, uh, and we found, we asked here and prevent participants how much, what sort of acid they were using, how much they were using. And we found that about a third of people were using way too much citric. Uh, it was very normal that people would report painful injections. You know, people shouldn't be, it shouldn't be painful when you inject. Most identified citric specifically as causing vein damage. And the reasons why people were using more citric than needed uh, were complex, but were related um, primarily in relation to the, the wording on the sachet, the sachet size, uh, I would say single use, so then they would think, well, uh, um, one sachet per hit. Um, there was also, there's also an issue of adulterants and um, cutting agents in the heroin that will dissolve less, less easily than the psychoactive substances. So people were adding more to try and get the, the crap to dissolve basically. 
and limited access to vitamin C or basic harm reduction information around how to, how to inject properly. Um, next slide, please. So in these photographs here, are we took, took photographs of the mission also of participants, and uh, these would sort of be typical presentations of what we'd see. Uh, and, you know, so, so there's the issue of vein care and prevention, but once people have an infection, then what happens? And we, and we know that there's huge barriers to accessing care. Now we ask people about the severity of their worst infection, and, um, you know, uh, so people with abscesses, 36% reported that their worst infection was, was very bad, was severe. And people with severe infections, this was associated with taking 10 or more days to, to access care. So, you know, delayed care seeking, worse infections, more likely to end up in hospital. It's, it's sort of intuitive, right? So what are the barriers to accessing care that we know about? Stigma, I could talk about that to the cows come home, but I'm not going to. Uh, I think we, we also need to take poverty seriously. And here I'm talking about not just um, financial poverty, but a poverty of time. And this material and time poverty interconnect. As you can see in the quotes, um, one of the participants says, you ain't got time to run around seeking care if you need to make money and go and score and stuff like this. And also importantly, another participant said, it costs 11 pounds to get to the GP surgery and back. I'm not entitled to any help with train fares. That's a big one for me. So he was expected to go to a clinic three times a week to get a very severe ulcer dressed. Now, obviously he couldn't afford that outlay of, of money to, to go as much as was needed, even though he really desired to, to get it cared for. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so, so given these circumstances, I think we really need to think about um, supporting self-care more. And it's great to see the work that the Scottish Drugs Forum and other places are doing, uh, like exchange supplies, et cetera, to, to capacitate that. So most of the participants practice self-care for their worst skin and soft tissue infection after noticing symptoms. And many desire the resources and support to do so safely. There was also a lot of anger there amongst people who had um, previously received uh, support to, to, to care for themselves, so they'd be given dressings, for example, and then this provision had stopped. So this quote here um, is illustrative, and it, he says, um, before I used to get takeaway dressings, it used to be cool, yeah, because I'm not handicapped, I can do my own dressings. I would do much better. I was doing fine until one of the workers in the hospital said, no, I don't think you should get takeaway dressings because he won't come in to see you. So this, this, you know, people would feel angry. They would feel that they weren't being trusted. And so then they were more likely to disengage. And, um, and but it was impossible also for many people to attend frequent wound care appointments. And, and so we really need to think more about, um, about capacitating people to, to care for their own wounds, especially like as a stopgap measure when they can't get in. Next slide, please. So, so just to sort of finish up really, um, to think about capacitating care in context of constraint. We are in, a, we, you know, obviously we're in a context of constraint right now with COVID, which, which I haven't talked about and that, that's a whole additional issue. But, you know, we're in a context of constraint in relation to austerity, budget constraints and all of this sort of thing. So we need to think about pragmatic things we can do to help. I, I, I mean, you know, I think it's absolutely fundamental that we get back to the basics and prioritise safe injecting and vein care advice and services. And, you know, a lot of um, providers don't feel comfortable giving this advice because they're under um, a recovery abstinence type remit, but we, it's, it's, it's crucial. Uh, we need to improve equipment supply and design, and I just want to um, highlight the amazing work that exchange suppliers have done this. They've been incredibly responsive to our research findings and have redesigned their citric acid packets to make it clearer that you don't need the whole packet uh, for one, one injection. We need to support appointment attendance through financial travel support, et cetera, and fundamentally also to provide alternatives to provide wound care equipment and training to train peers, to train lovers, partners, to, to care for wounds in the middle of the night, to do that sort of thing and work around um, different temporal orientations and priorities. 
And I, fundamentally, we need to acknowledge the expertise of people who inject drugs and work with peers in any sort of intervention development. And, and this quote from Jade illustrates, you know, the tenacity, the ingenuity, um, and the desire for self-care that many people illustrate. You know, she went and bought bandages from the chemist using her own money um, and cared for her wound herself. You know, and, and she said, you know, she, did, she would not want anyone else to do it because she felt shame. Shame is another whole issue, um, and that I realise I'm probably already over time, but I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to present on this issue. Thank you. Thanks, Magdalena. That was fantastic. Um, and it shows what kind of research you can get by going to people and exploring in a way which isn't kind of, which is just with them and the, the stuff that you can find out and also where we need to think about how our practice and what we can explore with our practice with people rather than to people and off people so that they because the person who's using is incre incredibly experienced they do know they've learned many things over the years so it's um so i'm sure there'll be heaps of questions um especially to your stuff magdalena afterwards and can i remind people um for the the to put questions into the tab down on the right there and um we'll um attempt to get through as many as we can today um, but next up, we have John Campbell, um, who is the IEP uh, manager of GGC NHS, and he's also the co-chair of the National um, IEP Guidelines um, Development Group, which hopefully we will be putting those out in the near future, but they've got COVID delayed like so many other things. So um, John's going to talk about some of the work that he's been doing in Glasgow uh, with the van and other things. Um, there's been obviously issues across Glasgow um, and John's been at the heart of working with them and trying to um, find solutions. So thank you, John. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much, Leon, for and the rest of the SDF for inviting me along to uh, deliver this uh, pre presentation. You know, essentially what I want to talk about today is the role of the IEP and harm reduction van throughout the, the COVID uh, situation. But I want to do this almost uh, as a kind of what's and all, if you like, uh, overview. Uh, okay, so next slide. Okay, for those who don't know, the, the IEP van, the Injecting Equipment Provision van, was procured uh, after uh, we lost our busiest needle exchange within the uh, central station. And that was an issue for us because that stopped evening provision within the heart of the, the city centre. So we procured this van, um, and the idea was to pack it as close to possible as the central station, but we wanted to provide more than just the provision of injecting equipment. You know, we wanted to provide uh, assessments of injecting risk, we wanted to provide naloxone, we also wanted to do uh, wound care uh, as well. So the van was set up as a comprehensive service to be delivered out of hours within the heart of the uh, city centre. Next slide. So a few pictures of the van, you can see there it's pretty inconspicuous. We didn't want any logo in the branding uh, or anything uh, on it. We've all resi resisted any uh, requests from media to come along and see the van in, uh, in operation. And the reason for that was because the van was parked, it was stable, if you like, at the same location. You know, we thought if media knew where it was operating from, it could be pretty uncomfortable for our, for our clients. The next slide. This just shows you the interior. So the interior is, is medical grade, which allows us to, to provide far more of a medical type service and, uh, and intervention. There's heating and everything in the back, so it's a fairly comfortable place to, to work. But it's essentially just a van. Next slide. Okay, so when COVID started to break, we were uh, with uh, pretty significant problems almost overnight. Uh, our winter uh, night shelter, uh, had identified a few suspected cases and they closed almost uh, immediately. Uh, we had a large uh, a large homeless population within the, the, the city centre, the homeless, I mean, some roofless, but in fact, the vast majority in, in temporary unstable accommodation. Uh, we housed them in three main hotels and some bed and breakfast accommodation within the, 
the city centre. But in the start of this, the, the, the kind of outbreak of the lockdown period in, in particular, there was a real attempt to try and confine people to these hotels, just as there was a real attempt to try and confine people to their, to their homes across uh, across the UK. Now, what we expected to happen at that time was there to be a significant dry up of drugs, a real shortage of drugs. That, that, that didn't happen. In fact, if anything, there was probably more drugs available. But what occurred relatively quickly in this outbreak was a shortage of cash. So that wasn't a good situation where you had a lot of drugs, but you didn't have a lot of money available for people to, take, uh, to buy drugs. Uh, so Turning Point Scotland, who were initially uh, manning the van, came up with other issues. They were, uh, if, you, if you like, kind of locking the, the Glasgow Drug Crisis Centre down, so no one in and out of the, the building. They were struggling with uh, PPE, so the decision was taken to, uh, to, to stop the van, uh, which obviously I think would have been a bit of disaster for us. But within two days, we had to put together uh, a team of volunteers that were prepared to uh, use a van and go into the heart of the city centre and, and, and take our uh, IEP harm reduction service uh, to, to the clients. Next slide. So we recruited uh, eight volunteers, but two of those volunteers were a reserve, so if someone dropped off because of COVID, we would be able to replace them. The volunteers came from an alcohol and drug recovery services, you know, myself through IEP, uh, we are with you, players are called Ad, Ad Action, and the coordinator of AB, uh, ADP uh, were all represented there. We decided then to have very small teams, so we had three small teams of two, um, and people committed to six weeks at a time with no swapping shifts and every night if possible. Uh, and that certainly worked. I, what we're trying to do there is stop any kind of cross contamination. So if someone was identified, you know, as, as having COVID, then they hadn't worked with the rest of the teams or whatever. Uh, okay, so the model had to change. So before we took the van into the heart of the city centre and we sat there and we waited for clients to, to, to come to us. Well, that was never going to work if we were trying to, you know, keep people in the hotels as much as possible. So yeah, we took the van into the heart of the city centre, parked at certain locations, and then we had your typical backpacks with rucksacks full of injecting equipment, you know, full of kind of wound care stuff. And we went out on the streets, we went to the hotels and we went to other locations where, where people were uh, people were injecting. So it was a bit of a fusion model, uh, if you like. Next slide, please. So I guess if you're trying to see if I uh, look at, you know, this, the success of, of this model, then uh, Neo is a best indicator. So Neo is a, Neo is a computerized uh, data collection system for all IEP transactions. Uh, and we can see when we look at the February, so February is a good month. That was a month where nothing much was happening, a fairly average month for, for, for IEP. You can see there was 106 transactions from the van. In April, that's a full month of lockdown. We had 337 transactions. And we look at the amount of needles and equipment we gave out. In February, that was 1,700, and that had increased to 7,500 uh, in, in April. So a massive jump in the amount of transactions that were taking place, and a massive increase in the, the provision of injecting equipment. Next slide, please. So the van ran for 49 consecutive nights with, with the volunteers, and over that time period, we conducted 518 transactions. 199 clients used the service. The vast majority of them were, were male, a ratio of roughly three to one. Uh, 162 individuals were supplied with naloxone. Over 10,000 needles and sheets of foil were provided. Uh, in the early stages, there were three administrations by us on, on clients that we found that were uh, unconscious, un unresponsive. That's now up at eight times naloxone has been used in the city centre in the same scenarios. Uh, and I guess what reduced a bit was the amount of injection related complications and wins we were able to we were able to address. Next slide. Okay. So this may seem as if this is this is a really good, a really good model and a perfect model. Um, and there are there are huge benefits, particularly in the amount of injecting equipment that we can get out. But you're limited to to what kind of work you can do, you know, the further you move away from uh, from that van. And if I'm honest, it, it was a, a, a really frightening, particularly for the first three or four weeks, it was a very frightening situation where we were going into the heart of the city centre, we are going to the hotels, 
the clients were struggling with the concept of a social social distancing. Uh, you know, some of the things we were faced with wasn't wasn't related to wasn't related to injecting. You know, people had been had been battered. You know, by, by other people. Uh, um, again, the consequence of uh, lots of drugs, but not a lot of money to uh, to buy them. A lot of people present to us as homeless, nowhere to sleep, nowhere to sleep that night. Uh, but really challenged us to, to work with a whole host of other uh, other services, many of whom of whom were you know kind of kind of closing down temporarily at that point uh, as well. And what we weren't able to do uh, during that period was, was any blood tests. Now we are using the van now to go back into the city centre during the day. We train staff uh, and, and carry out a significant number of blood tests. So we're doing between twenty and thirty BBV tests within the heart of the city centre uh, every week. And of course, you know, if you look at the backdrop of Glasgow, we have around 170 people from the, the current outbreak of HIV positive, and that's really, really important that we, that we carry that, that on. Uh, but now, so I mean, the families go to these different locations, there was, there was real mistrust from, particularly from the hotel staff or the security that had been um, employed as well. Uh, you know, they, they, they would view us. Kind of rocking up outside the, the hotels and, and handing out, you know, needles and and foil and whatever, and uh, they had viewed that as a uh, as a problem. Uh, but we were able to, to link in with them. We were able to train the hotel staff uh, on the lock zone uh, and, and make sure the lock zone was available within all those sites uh, as well. Uh, one of those hotels had uh, two two fatalities, so uh, they could see the. The need and the significance of of, of naloxone and overdose response very quickly in this outbreak. Okay, good. Next slide, sorry. Uh, okay, and I, th I think this is useful as well. We've been looking at the the, the equipment. So th th this is, this is wider. Th this is more than just the van. Th this is Glasgow City Centre. Uh, now I've taken this from April in 2019. And looking at the equipment we give out, we gave out from a city centre outlet. So you can see just over 21,000 uh, needles or, or sheet, sheets of foil. Uh, and if we look at April, that's a full month of, of lockdown. The amount of equipment we've given out has actually uh, has actually increased. Uh, and the van has played a major part in that. But so has keeping our community pharmacies within the heart of the city centre running as well. We, we've seen that the Overall number of clients has dropped. We can see the transactions have dropped, uh, but we can see when they are visiting that they're doing as we're asking and taking away a lot more uh, injecting equipment and a lot more secondary uh, distribution happening at that point as well. Next slide. Thank you very much. That's it. That was fine. I'll start anyway because the first question yeah. is for John. Okay, so well, that's good. The first... <laughs> yeah, because John's there. The first question for John is, how can active drug injectors be managed in homeless hostels or shelters? Okay, uh, I think this this current COVID situation has almost forced us to take a, a services to different populations. You know, so just, just as we did with injecting equipment, uh, we also have uh, an outreach pharmacy team that are active every day within the, 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 the hotels. I use the term hotels very loosely. They are essentially now just just, just large large hostels. I know that Waverly Care are also going into, uh, into the hotels and providing BBV testing. Uh, we know that Sandyford are, are sending sexual health nurses in, in, into the, the hotels. And the, the, re the reason that the reason we're able to do this is because our mainstream services have, you know, very much restricted restricted access. So what do you do with a full staff team when you've got restricted access for your base? You know, it becomes far easier then to mobilise them and get them to go and meet people where they are. At. And, and I'm really hoping that this is a model that that that, that sticks. You know, I think for the past two decades, you know, we've worked off. Uh, 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 an appointment system where we expected the you know we expected people to turn up at a particular time you know for um, a, an appointment and we get quite frustrated when that didn't happen you know but we didn't really take the services to them so there's an opportunity here thanks john 
Um, this one's for you, Magdalena. So someone wrote in and said, one of the things we've embraced in COVID is telemedicine and phone contact with our clients. I wonder if this is now the time to capitalise on this for wound care, an example of which would be sending a photo for someone to look at and get back to you on advice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was talking about this as an option before, before COVID happened, that you know, it would be great to develop some sort of app where, or something where people could take a photograph of their wound, it gets sent to a, a, a service and, um, and then the nurse could look at it or whatever and reply say um, do this or go to hospital immediately because otherwise your arm's going to fall off or or whatever you know that I mean I think that would be absolutely fantastic um, to overcome some of the barriers that people have going to services or indeed feeling that there aren't any localized services available to them uh, and even if, if people could do it anonymously that would be great as well because a lot of people um, are concerned about their key workers knowing that they're currently injecting um, issues like that. So actually, I think, you know, we've got a lot of things that we can learn from from um, from COVID and, and that we should build on and capitalise on, and that, that is definitely one of them. Thank you very much. Um, John, another one for you. Um, why was the volunteer um, model used as opposed to the paid roles? I think this is in relation to starting the van. Um, and, and why was that adopted rather than paid roles? Uh, okay, um, so we had two two working days uh, to put a, to put a team together. You know, there was no organisation we could have went to and asked for and asked for staff if you like at that point. But we were also aware that you know that this 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 is quite a high risk situation. You know, it wasn't part of anyone's role at that 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 particular time. Uh, so we tried to do with the volunteers as approach. A mix of people, you know, so approached nursing staff that had, you know, a significant experience within the field, um, but also we recruited two staff that had uh, lived experience that we thought was incredibly important uh, uh, as well. But we had a lot of support within the two days. You know, we had the basic training. I was out every night for the first pretty much two weeks, providing on the job training for for the for the volunteers as well. At the end of every shift. We had a, a, a WhatsApp debrief, and that would also then uh, benefit the staff who were taking the van on the, the next night as as well. So there was quite a bit of support uh, built into it, but uh, it was convenient. We needed it up and running straight straight away. We needed people to commit to that on a personal level. Great, thank you, John. Um, Magdalena, this is a sort of two part question. The first part of the question is someone asking the difference between citric and vitamin C, if you've looked at that and if there's any findings. I know that's a question that comes up common. And then the second part, is it common for um, people accessing IEPs to ask for extra um, acid uh, when they're getting their IEP? And is this something you've found and in, in, is worrying to you? Okay. Um, so firstly, in relation to difference between citric and vitamin C. Vitamin C is a bit more forgiving. You can use more and, um, and the solution is, is less acidic. Um, people generally tend to have a preference either for vitamin C or, or for citric. But um, what we found when we were doing uh, the, the acidity studies and also in talking to people is that vitamin C seems to be less damaging for the veins. Um, and so uh, I think it would be great if, if people were sort of able to take that on board. And uh, and also in terms of service provision, if people offered the the uh, the option of either having citric or vitamin C, a lot of people say that they don't have any choice. They just they they get a pack and and they get what they get basically. And uh, and a lot of places don't provide um, don't provide vit C. But from from my work and from uh, Jenny Scott's work and and from you know indications are. That vitamin C is 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 better to, to prepare a drug injection with than, than citric. Um, in terms of uh, so the question of people getting needle and syringes uh, asking for more citric. That, that yeah, was, that's okay. yeah. So yeah, so that's I mean that's interesting in terms of, like we did a group with um, some people who injected drugs in London. One group. And they mentioned that, that citric was often the first thing to go. Um, I think that there, there are a couple of issues here. Okay, so 
uh, and which may actually speak to people not getting enough needles and syringes. And that you can reuse your own needles and syringes if you're cooking up a hip, right? You're not obviously not able to yet reuse um, citric. So this may be about um, people uh, using the same pack for, for multiple injections, um, being able to reuse their own needles and syringes, but running out of citric. Uh, and, and there's also an issue of secondary uh, supply. So people were saying, um, you know, when they go and get a pack, you know, there, there are other people who don't want to, to access uh, pharmacy needle and syringe exchange because they don't want to be seen as users and they'll always ask if they can um, have their citric and things like this. So I don't necessarily think that it indicates that people are using too much per injection. Mm. I, but I think that uh, it, it's, it, it's important that people know that they don't need to use a whole sachet per injection, that, that, that generally half a sachet should be enough. Uh, the problem is, is, that, is that the heroin we, you know, that people are using and the crack cocaine that people are using is full of adulterants, full of cutting agents, and that will take longer to dissolve. But if people can, so it's going to require a sort of cultural change where people feel that they're able to leave that residue at the bottom of the spoon and not have to dissolve at all. You know, and I understand why people want to get a clear mix, but they're not necessarily getting any more psychoactive drug by adding more acid. So there's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a complex issue, but I've really yeah, on it. I think that's really helpful. Um, I don't know if you want to add in, John, to that in terms of what you see in Glasgow with, with citric distribution, um, if that is part of the trend as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, when uh, citric and, and vitamin C became uh, allowed under the, the Misuse of Drugs Act and banana pilot in Glasgow, so we, we gave people access to, uh, to, to both. But I guess as, as citric had been the historical, uh, you know, as, as, acidifier, then it was citric that, that, won, that won hands down. I think it's fair to say that, that citric, you know, and, and like for like is a far more effective uh, acidifier, although you're absolutely, I would agree with you about the, uh, the risk of over acidity, you know, with even a small amount, uh, a small amount too much. The uh, issue for us would be things like providing our equipment in one, one hit kits. That's, that's something we decided to do a, a decade ago. So for every injection, you know, we, we encourage people to have the, the full range of in, injecting equipment. So within that would be one sachet of citric. And we will also then look at how people are preparing the drugs in, in Glasgow. Then, yeah, a lot of people are preparing batches of drugs. So that batch even to be shared between two, three, uh, uh, more more people. So also the amount of uh, uh, citric acid then would, uh, or any acidifier would, would, would vary uh, greatly. But we would love to see you know, the continued research, Mag Magdalena and influence the way we provide uh, an acidifier and what acidifier we, uh, we provide, really, really useful. Can I just come in, can I just come yep. in briefly there? Mag Magdalena, just with, um, with resources for um, maintaining venous access, so getting the knowledge out there, um, what do you think is the best way? Because if services sign up to actually putting correct knowledge and just and not you know that it's it is totally based on full harm reduction and on knowledge and education what how do you think we can go about that well you know could, could services like think about providing safe injecting workshops and you know all of these things seem to, to feel like a, a such a shocking thing in this environment but really they're fundamental and we need um, some safe injecting advice, you know, things like, you know, use the lowest gauge um, needle possible, rotate your sights, um, uh, helping people to, to find veins, to know which are the most safest veins to use, maybe having um, anatomy posters up where you have all the veins, uh, telling people about um, not only the dangers of femoral injecting, but if they're going to do it, how to do it properly so they're not hitting the artery. Um, you know, I, I, services need to acknowledge that, that people inject and people need to feel able to disclose that they're injecting and ask for advice about how to do it safely. You know, I think um, we just need to, to really move away 
from this focus on that services are there to, to stop people injecting, to move them off drugs, you know, that, that people services need to meet people where they're at. And, um, and if they want to inject, then they need to be enabled to do so safely. And that's going to um, facilitate a better relationship and then when people are ready to stop, then they'll feel more able to get the help that they need. Thank you, Matt. Um, Thank you. I've got, there's two questions came in just now relating to the Citric discussion. So I'll just quickly ask you and then we can move on from that. The first one is to both of you, John and, and Magdalena is why, why can't we just move away and, and, and leave citric acid and just provide vitamin C only? Would this be something that we'd look to do in the future? Uh, okay, so, so the, yeah, sure. But um, a lot of people prefer citric. So, you know, I think it's better to, to, to provide both. Uh, and, and to provide the information about um, the relative benefits or not of both. Because um, if there's a preference, you know, people should be able to access that. And, and I, I'm, I'm not really into like enforcing change on people because that can backfire in unexpected ways. You know, people might go back to using lemon or whatnot. Or, mm -hmm. People want citric. They can always you can access citric through um through different sources. So uh, I I just think it's about providing options and providing more information uh, and capacitating people to make to make their own informed decisions around what they want to do. Um, and and if if there's going to be a move to um, getting rid of citric and just having bit C then there needs to be proper service user uh, engagement around that. That can only be done if it's acceptable to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Johnny, and same, same as Magdalena there. Uh, no, I, 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 absolutely. I guess what I would say as well is, yes, they're, they're both acidifiers. They need roughly twice as much vitamin C as you, as you would with the citric, although it's definitely got a better safety profile. Uh, so potentially, certainly in the initial stages of providing both where you have in previous, you know, the potential there is people aren't aware in amounts. So the last sachet they had, they had to use a whole a whole sachet and then they've provided a different sachet. So they're using a the whole sachet of that where they probably didn't have to as well. You know, I think as Mag Magdalena has, 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 uh, has highlighted, whatever we're doing, we need, we, need, we need discussion. You know, there's a fantastic tool now available across across each uh, health board area, an assessment the injecting risk tool, the, the, the air tool, and it takes a member of staff and and the, the, the person through a full assessment process solely related to how they prepare and inject their drugs. I've not seen anything else like it, and it would be, be really useful if people get familiar with, with that tool and the proper use of the acidifier as part of that as, as, as part of that as well. And you'll mostly see the tool, Sophie, that it tells you in every single page the mm -hmm. proper use of a acidifier you know, where infection to take infection to take hold far easier. It can cause damage to the vein. It can be, you know, so it gives you the reasons why. And it's just about using those those resources, yeah. not just gathering if it's not important in a bag. Great. Um, so that's, we'll leave Citric there. The, the next question, there's, there's a few more questions left. Um, um, Magdalena, one for you. We, we're, coming, we're coming very quickly to the end of the end of the thing, so it'll cut us all off. So um, unfortunately, I'll have to cut you all off. And, and what, what, what we'll do for the audience is, um, like last week, um, we'll have we'll, this will be published on the SDF YouTube channel, but um, but we'll the replies from those questions, we'll get replies from all the panellists and we'll put the replies to those questions there because we've got to come to the end of the webinar. We'll also be sending out an evaluation that'd be excellent if people could complete that for us. The next webinars uh, next Friday, 27th of June at 1pm again, um, and a link to the register for the next webinar will be in the evaluation email you receive. So it'd be great to have you join us again. Um, and just to highlight again that you can now access e-learning um, online um, at SDF or at that link on the sidebar of your question panel there. And because morbidity can be very severe for bacterial infections with outcomes worsened by delays in seeking healthcare, um, we've seen mortality can occur from invasive infections um, 
wound care provided in a sensitive, caring and knowledgeable manner is a cornerstone of good practice and something is all of us want when we use healthcare. So we need to think how we can provide it in the best way possible. So I'd encourage all of you to try the e-learning out just to get the, the basics uh, a good start. So finally, I'd like to thank you all for attending and a special thanks to today's speakers, Alison, who spoke twice, cool, um, Magdalena Harris and John Campbell for what's been a really informative and engaging session. And thanks again, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.